Hello everyone, uh, I'm here to read a poem to you today. Uh, this is the first part today of The Hunting of the Snark, which is a long poem by Lewis Carroll. Um, Lewis Carroll, I know, will be familiar to you from the um, great children's uh, novel, um, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Um, it's a much shorter piece than those novels, but it's quite a, quite long for a poem. Um, Lewis Carroll's writing in a, a similar kind of style, He's using similar humour, playing with language, playing with ideas. It's a bit of a darker piece, though. It's a rather dark tale of, of a quest that goes wrong. Um, Lewis Carroll wrote it in eight fits, eight parts. Um, I'm going to be reading it in four parts, so two fits per film. So I'm going to give you two fits uh, today. I'm going to leave you in a massive... Uh, on a massive cliffhanger at the end of the second fit. Um, this is a story about a, a group of uh, motley crew of people who go hunting together, hunting some kind of creature called a snark. Um, they're led by the bellman. Bellman is a character we're going to hear lots about, especially in the second fit. Um, the person you want to really listen out for in the first fit is the baker, because he's going to be the really important character later on. Um, so listen out for him when he comes in. Let's go with Fit the First, The Landing. Just the place for a snark, the bellman cried as he landed his crew with care, supporting each man on the top of the tide by a finger entwined in his hair. Just the place for a snark, I have said it twice, that alone should encourage the crew. Just the place for a, for a snark. I have said it thrice. What I tell you three times is true. The crew was complete. It included a boots, a maker of bonnets and hoods, a barrister brought to arrange their disputes, and a broker to value their goods. A billiard marker whose skill was immense might perhaps have won more than his share, but a banker engaged at enormous expense had the whole of their cash in his care. There was also a beaver that paced on the deck or would sit making lace in the bow and had often, the bellman said, saved them from wreck, though none of the sailors knew how. There was one who was famed for the number of things he forgot when he entered the ship, his umbrella, his watch, all his jewels and rings and the clothes he had bought for the trip. He had 42 boxes, all carefully packed with his name painted clearly on each. But since he omitted to mention the fact, they were all left behind on the beach. He had 42 boxes. I've read that line already. The loss of his clothes hardly mattered because he had seven coats on when he came with three pairs of boots. But the worst of it was he had wholly forgotten his name. He would answer to hi or to any loud cry such as fry me or fritter my wig to what you may call him and what was his name, but especially thingamajig. While for those who preferred a more forcible word, he had different names from these. His intimate friends called him Candle Ends and his enemies Toasted Cheese. His form is ungainly, his intellect small, so the bellman would often remark. But his courage is perfect and that, after all, is the thing that one needs with a snark. He would joke with hyenas, returning their stare with an impudent wag of the head. And he once went to walk, poor in poor, with a bear, just to keep up its spirits, he said. He came as a baker, but owned when too late, and it drove the poor bellman half mad. He could only bake bride cake, which I may state no materials were to be had. The last of the crew needs a special remark, though he looked an incredible dunce. He had just one idea, and that one being snark, the good bellman engaged him at once. He came as a butcher, but gravely declared when the ship had been sailing a week, he could only kill beavers. The bellman looked scared and was almost too frightened to speak, but at length he explained in a tremulous tone there was only one beaver on board. And that was a tame one he had of his own, whose death would be deeply deplored. The beaver, who happened to hear the remark, protested with tears in its eyes that not even the rapture of hunting the snark could atone for that dismal surprise. 
it's strongly advised that the butcher should be conveyed in a separate ship. But the bellman declared that would never agree with the plans he had made for the trip. Navigation was always a difficult art, though with only one ship and one bell, and he feared he must really decline for his part undertaking another as well. The beaver's best course was no doubt to procure a second-hand dagger-proof coat. So the baker advised it, and next to ensure its life in some office of note. This the banker suggested, and offered for hire on moderate terms or for sale, two excellent policies, one against fire and one against damage from hail. Yet, still, ever after that sorrowful day, whenever the butcher was by, the beaver kept looking the opposite way and appeared unaccountably shy. Fit the second, the bellman's speech. The bellman himself, they all praise to the skies. Such a carriage, such ease and such grace, such solemnity too. One could see he was wise the moment one looked in his face. He had bought a large map representing the sea without the least vestige of land, and the crew were much pleased when they found it to be a map they could all understand. What's the good of Mercator's north poles and equators, tropic zones and meridian lines? So the bellman would cry, and the crew would reply, they are merely conventional signs. Other maps are such shapes with their islands and capes, but we've got our brave captain to thank. So the crew would protest that he's bought us the best, a perfect and absolute blank. This was charming, no doubt, but they shortly found out that the captain they trusted so well had only one notion for crossing the ocean, and that was to tingle his bell. He was thoughtful and grave, but the orders he gave were enough to bewilder a crew. When he cried, steer to starboard, but keep her head larboard, what on earth was the helmsman to do? Then the bowsprit got mixed with a rudder sometimes, a thing, as the bellman remarked, that frequently happens in tropical climes when a vessel is, so to speak, snarked. But the principal failing occurred in the sailing, and the bellman, perplexed and distressed, said he had hoped at least, when the wind blew due east, that the wind, the ship would not travel due west. But the danger was past. They had landed at last with their boxes, portmanteaus and bags. Yet at first sight, the crew were not pleased with the view, which consisted of chasms and crags. The bellman perceived that their spirits were low and repeated in musical tone some jokes he had kept for a season of woe. But the crew would do nothing but groan. He served out some grog with a liberal hand and bade them sit down on the beach, and they could not but own that their captain looked grand as he stood and delivered his speech. Friends, Romans and countrymen, lend me your ears. They were all of them fond of quotations, so they drank to his health and they gave him three cheers while he served out additional rations. We have sailed many months, we have sailed many weeks. Four weeks to the months you may mark. But never as yet, it is your captain who speaks, have we caught the least glimpse of a snark. We have sailed many weeks, we have sailed many days, seven days to the week I allow. But a snark on the which we might lovingly gaze, we have never beheld until now. Come listen, my men, while I tell you again the five unmistakable marks by which you may know wheresoever you go. The warranted, genuine snarks. Let us take them in order. The first is the taste, which is meagre and hollow, but crisp, like a coat that is rather too tight in the waist, with a flavour of a willow the wisp. Its habit of getting up late, you'll agree, that it carries too far when I say that it frequently breakfasts at five o'clock tea and dines on the following day. The third is its slowness in taking a jest, should you happen to venture on one. It will sigh like a thing that is deeply distressed, and it always looks grave at a pun. The fourth is its fondness for bathing machines, which it constantly carries about, and believes that they add to the beauty of scenes, a sentiment open to doubt. The fifth is ambition. It next will be right to describe every 
each particular batch, distinguishing those that have feathers and bite from those that have whiskers and scratch. For although common snarks do no manner of harm, yet I feel it my duty to say some are boojums. The bellman broke off in alarm, for the baker had fainted away. I said there would be a cliffhanger, and that's the end of Fit the Second. Our next fit is The Baker's Tale, where we'll find out all about why the baker fainted away when he heard the word boojum. So I will hear, uh, I will see you, speak to you uh, then. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs>